there is every possibility that you may miss um, uh, the creatinine. And one more thing, uh, because it takes uh, because it it takes longer time. There there is an entity called subclinical AKI. What does it mean? So you have normal creatinine and normal urine output, but the patient's kidney is not normal. So how do you know that? So normal creatinine, normal urine output, but there are more sensitive markers, biomarkers like NGAL, in which situation you call them subclinical AKA. So only the biomarkers are telling you that the, your patient is patient's kidneys are not working normally and they may take, take uh, the, it may get obvious after some time. So this subclinical AKA is obviously a significant finding because mortality and need for renal replacement therapy compared to bio, biomarker negative patients, they have higher requirement, higher mortality. So this is a significant uh, um, parameter, uh, the biomarker positive uh, AKI, but clinically negative. And this is because you are using a more sensitive indicator, though it is not widely available. And uh, I haven't uh, used uh, NGAL as a renal function marker so far. So the benefits of detecting subclinical AKI would include the possibility of avoiding further uh, kidney injury or renal insult and optimizing the renal function much before it is obviously uh, obvious clinically, that is in terms of creatinine or urine. And then comes to the second, coming to the second point, that is oliguria or drop in urine output. So there are both physiological and pathological reasons for drop in urine output, which can be independent of the kidney function. So the physiological, if, if you're not drinking enough of water and you're hypovolemic, there is compensatory mechanism, renin angiotensin system, and the pain and nausea which result in sympathetic activation and increased production of antidiuretic hormone. These all uh, factors result in decreased urine volume, decreased urine volume, and uh, you may call it oliguria, but it may be physiological. And coming to the pathological, there can be renal hypoperfusion, sepsis, nephrotoxin, and cast nephropathy. And this uh, would result in acute kidney injury and this would result in oliguria. So, when you are looking for the pathological factors, the physiological factors may interfere or the physiological factors may be assumed as pathological factors and we may end up overdiagnosing AKI and starting treatment unnecessarily. So, we should be careful. We have to look 360 degree for these, the, all the possible causes and act accordingly. So obesity, if you have taken the actual weight and not the ideal weight, then you would expect more uh, urine volume. So many, many guidelines, they suggest using ideal weight and not actual body weight, right? So, so that we don't overdiagnose AKI. And also, uh, oliguria uh, due to acute temporary release of uh, ADH hormone, which can occur in post-operative period, nausea and pain, and res results in decreased volume, that also to be taken care of before we label the patient AKI using urine output criteria. So what is cystatin C? Cystatin C is produced in all nucleated cells and this is released into plasma at a constant rate and it has a low molecular weight and that facilitates complete glomerular filtration. At the same time, it is completely reabsorbed in the proximal tubular cell and it is catabolized. So if we can use cystatin C as a marker of kidney function, that would be independent of the glomerular filtration rate because there is no influence of glomerular filtration rate on the cystatin C concentration in the nephrons. 
So this is not influenced by GFR and um, and any other parameter, and it's only influenced by corticosteroid therapy and, and thyroid disease, and it is more accurate than creatinine-based method. It has a shorter half-life, me telling you that it is more sensitive. You can diagnose earlier than using creatinine. But this is not 100%. There are studies. Some studies saying that it is going to be very sensitive, very reliable diagnostic marker. And there are studies uh, uh, saying opposite also. So we probably have to wait for a little longer before we depend on cystatin C for diagnosing AKI. And there is something else called gruesomite stress test. This we do in, day, day, in and day out. Like if your nurse comes to you saying that your patient's uh, urine output is less, the first name, uh, response would be, okay, let me see. Go, you go and see the patient, assess the volume status, assess the uh, hemodynamic, uh, uh, hemodynamic using probably heart rate and blood pressure. And the next intervention would be giving a bolus dose of smile, right? So I'm sure most of us would have done this. So flusamide, how much do you give? Usually 20, 40, 60, 80, some arbitrary number. But there is a, a standardized test that is called flusamide stress test where you give 1 milligram per kilo of flusamide. That is like 60 or 80 milligrams based on your patient's body weight. If the patient wasn't exposed to uh, furosemide in the previous seven days, and you would increase the dose to 1.5 milligram per kilo, if the patient had uh, furosemide in the past seven days, and what is the expected response? If the urine output is more than 200 ml as a response to your furosemide injection for the next two hours, you would call that the patient kidney function is good. And if it is less than 200 ml in the two hours from the injection, you would call it um, uh, a positive test. And this reflects the re renal tubular functional integrity. And flusamide binds to albumin and it is actively secreted into the tubular lumen in the proximal convoluted tubule and delivered into the thick, asc thick ascending loop. All of us have read in the pharmacology. And the good part of this test is it is very sensitive. If you had given this in stage one and stage two of AKI, and this would be predicting very well if the patient is likely to go into stage three of AKI, or is he going to need renal replacement therapy and, and corresponding inpatient mortality. So this is a highly sensitive test, and we all have done it, though unknowingly, actually. And um, so this is one of the useful, highly sensitive and specific tests. And what is negative about this test? If the patient is aneuric, or, uh, but still, uh, even when you think of giving um, um, giving crucemide, you have to look at the hemodynamics. You can't give flusamide for a patient who is hypotensive, achycardic, or in shock. Unless there is enough of fluid in the vasculature, there is no point in giving flusamide and you would land in further trouble than making your patient better. So that's the problem with this flusamide test. So what would be the future like? The future would be like, uh, it's not just uh, the functional markers. What are the functional markers we looked at? One, the serum creatinine. Two, the urine output. And also, there are there is a big list of biomarkers, and there is a lot of literature available on the biomarkers for renal function. And I have just mentioned the names of them because it will be too much to discuss um, the individual biomarkers at this stage, and they are not in wider use except uh, as research tools. And except for this NGAL, which is occasionally we do discuss about NGAL in various clinical situations, and it is available in certain centers. 
So this is the list of uh, um, urinary uh, biomarkers, that is urinary tubular enzymes, um, which is uh, again a list of six or seven, and urina urinary kidney injury molecule, urinary interleukin 18, uh, neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalcin, that is NGAL, and urinary liver type fatty acid binding protein, LFABP, and urinary tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase 2, and uh, insulin like growth factor binding protein, and urinary CC motif chemokine ligand 14, CCL 14. This is the list. And in future, probably one of these or some of these biomarkers will be linked along with the uh, functional biomarkers, that is the uh, urine output and the creatinine, so that the diagnostic criteria are more sensitive and may be useful in prognostication of the patients also. Um, and then, what is the diagnostic uh, workup that we uh, uh, we can use? Okay, we work uh, when we are. Uh, uh, treating a patient with possible AKI. We look at the blood counts with differential uh, counts and different uh, urine dipstick tests and urine microscopy. And urine microscopy is usually available. It is uh, not very uh, difficult to get, though the reliability is doubtful. Uh, and there will be a lot of subjective variations in the reports. And also, you would think of uh, the renal ultrasound, which is very informative and very useful as far as uh, the kidney uh, workup is concerned, and serum calcium. And if you have uh, the necessary information based on these tests, you would uh, go ahead uh, with a label of AK uh, based on the functional markers and proceed further. And if you, if at all you are suspecting any particular pathology as an etiology for AKI, uh, the list in these yellow squares is the possible etiology for uh, suspected uh, etiology for acute kidney injury, and the big list of tests are given, and you can do these tests and label the patients uh, AKI along with the possible etiology, and that is the beauty of this. Uh, diagnostic workup and probably at this point an intensivist would take the help of uh, a nephro, uh, nephrologist or other uh, helping specialties, medical speciality like hematology or oncology or whatever. We look at take the help of other specialties and then uh, go ahead with the treatment of the patient. <laughs>